Welcome. So we are here at the Busy Hub uh, meetup, and we uh, we thank also Julien for opening the floor for speakers, special speakers like Yuka Chow today. Um, today about the Octalysis framework for gamification and how to apply that in organizations. Behavioral design, we can call that. Uh, we can learn about it informally. We do that together uh, with Sawsen and also with uh, Julien and myself, Abram. We get to understand who's in the, the call and uh, what we can do uh, to understand and learn about behavioral design and gamification. So uh, uh, I'd, I'd like to ask maybe us who are in the call, maybe you could introduce yourself a little bit, starting with uh, Yukai and uh, Julien to invite the, the two main parties, the Busy Hub and uh, Yukai Chow. You can start right. yeah, with Yukai. Go ahead. So hello everyone. So I'm uh, Yukai Chow, it's a pleasure to be here. I started my uh, journey into gamification and behavioral design since 2003. So about 20 years ago now. And uh, I'm most known for creating this, this thing called the Octalysis Framework that you'll learn today. Wrote a book called Actionable Gamification. And uh, I regularly teach my framework place like Stanford University, Harvard, Yale, Oxford, Tesla, Google, IDEO, uh, you know, a handful of governments. Uh, I was rated the number one gamification guru in the world out of the top 100 gurus, uh, three out of four years. The other year I was uh, number two and I, and then they made me a judge afterwards. So I got disqualified for being a guru, it seems. <laughs> uh, and uh you know, I do a lot of design work for clients and our design work has impact over 1.5 uh, billion users uh, worldwide. And now working on my second book called 10,000 Hours of Play. Thanks, UK. So yeah, Julian, I'm the Busy Hub owner. And uh, in my professional life, uh, I'm involved in um, uh, project management, uh, agility, business agility. And I've been working with uh, Abraham as well at Amadeus. Uh, and I think uh, his experience is uh, is welcome uh, here because he is into this uh, gamification. And uh, yeah, I, I'm just hosting this. Uh, so thanks for uh, for being with us, Yukai. Sawsen. Hi. <laughs> um, so I'm a, what do I start with? Uh, my name is Sawsen. I'm an agile coach uh, um, slash SPC, whatever. I used to be a computer scientist and then I moved to the dark side, started working with people. No, I'm joking. Um, but um, when we first um, spoke about this, so I work with uh, Abraham uh, for Amadeus and I met Julian Amadeus as well uh, when he worked with us. And the whole thing started off when we we're having a beer and discussing what the next uh, busy hub subject should be about and julian brought up the uh, uh gamification and behavioral design and i said yeah i know that book but i was actually confusing it with another book on gamification as well um so i'm very happy to have discovered this and happy to have had the uh, opportunity to actually uh, talk it out today all right thanks yeah uh abram uh, uh, i i'm uh also in Amadeus now, used to be around the world working with uh, organizations for uh, transformations in change management and so on. In 2011, I uh, graduated as a master with change management, and I thought that that should be nicer than just, you know, study management stuff. So I also did something with game, but in that case, it was simulation games, and that's a bit more... Uh, uh, a solid form than gamification yeah? instead of bringing game elements to the work that is more like bringing a whole game into the work and playing out a situation but uh, that was my background I actually studied for a while also in uh, uh, University of Pennsylvania online uh, gamification that, that used to be and maybe still is a course and then I found also uh, your work uh, Yukai and and uh, since then, I've brought it up with some people, and uh, some people they know you from long back. Maybe you know John Fury from Mind Time still. Uh, that's a while back. He says, "Oh, I know you guy. I worked with him when it was still like maybe twenty years ago. I don't know." So um, it's good to to know that there's a whole world that is uh, expert in uh, applying game techniques. 
uh, on business and in, in all kinds of surroundings. But for many people, this is very far from their reality. And so I don't know how it is for you. I see you sometimes in TED Talks and, and Google and all kinds of places you show up. And now you're with us. Thank you, Yukai. Uh, the question is, what's in it for you to do all of this? Uh, is it still like a, a game to you or is it too serious? Yeah, I think I started gamifying my life uh, very early. That's the first thing I gamified. And so... Uh, I don't think I am working all the time. I think I'm enjoying and playing all the time and doing what I'm passionate about. So, you know, some people, when they treat their lives like a game, they work like a game, they become workaholics. Like, why would, you, why would I go to the beach if I could be playing my favorite game? Uh, and that's kind of the subject of my second book, 10,000 Hours of Play, where you spend 10,000 hours of your life not working, but playing and you become successful through that. So yeah, just uh, I'm, I'm passionate to share about what I've discovered, the Octalysis framework, gamification, it changed my life. I've seen it change uh, tens of thousands or millions of lives out there. And I just want more people to uh, have that and see this impact in the world. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And uh, while I don't consider myself an expert, I haven't had those 10,000 hours uh, of play uh, in, a, in a serious context yet. Um, I, I do consider myself as a person who is more than average knowledgeable about it. And still, it's super hard for me to understand how in a environment without spending 100,000 or more euros on the platform, I could actually do something with gamification. It takes some, some, some craziness and out of the ordinary work, it seems sometimes. So let's, let's uncover that today in the, the time that we have. Um, would you agree that indeed gamification is utilizing game techniques in non-game contexts. So let's play at work, or how would you describe that gamification? I like to go to the core root of the word itself to gamify some things to make it more game-like, right? Um, so then the question is, what does it mean to make something more game-like? It doesn't need to have animations or quests or rewards. And so you may know for me, making something game like is making it more engaging and game and uh, enjoyable. So that's why I have the Octalysis framework with the eight core drives because games literally are just created for engagement and motivation. There's no real purpose to a game, right? It's not because you need to do it. Uh, even if they create a, a purpose like de defeating this dragon or saving the city, that's just a made up excuse to entertain the brain. So games are created just to engage and, and uh, motivate and to entertain. And so when you take something that's not for entertainment, but you make it entertaining, to me, that's gamification design. When we look at uh, uh, gamification in that in that light, I would expect a lot of techniques being thrown around. And, and I do see that. But when you speak about it, you speak about motivational drives, which seems like, okay, that's like, that's like almost a whole other field to talk about. How do you connect those? How do you connect the Octalysis different motivational aspects to say, yeah. okay, so let's gamify? Yeah, so you're showing a screenshot of my Octalysis framework. So it's first it's called Octalysis because it's the word octagon combined with analysis. And again, it has these eight core drives that motivate all our behavior. So everything we do is based on one or more of these eight core drives, which means that if there's none of these eight core drives, there's zero motivation and no behavior happens. And once you have these eight core drives, then you can find different game design techniques that bring out these eight core drives, like, um, like points and badges bring out core drive to develop an accomplishment. This narrative could bring up the sense of core drive one epic meaning and calling. Group quests could bring up core drive five, social influence relatedness. But it's very important to start up with these psychological core drives because that is what actually engages and motivates people. You could have the game design techniques, but it doesn't trigger any core drives and it doesn't do anything. For instance, badges, they're supposed to be about core drive to develop an accomplishment, but some badges are so meaningless, they're so silly. You click a button and says, hey, you have a, I click a button badge. Here's a, here's a you know, badge and tr trophy to celebrate it. And most people don't feel accomplished at all. They're like, hey, I'm not in kindergarten. This is so silly. And at the end of the day, it's just the icon. Right, So the designer needs to build the meaning into the icon. Is it something that people are actually proud of that they want to share with others and brag about it to their through their friends and family? 
And so you could have the game design technique, but not have the core drive. Or you can have a lot of social buttons, your friend this, friend that, but people don't actually feel socially connect with others or socially appreciated or the thrill of competition. So that's why to design things successfully and actually be engaging, which is what I say gamification, to gamify is to make things engaging, uh, you actually need these eight core drives. You need to understand how it appeals to the brain. Thank you. Um, and, and if you... Uh, could we apply the Octalysis framework or the analysis uh, in it? Uh, could we apply that to any random work situation? Say, uh, and, and we're coming soon with that, like a, a, a community of practice environment with 8,000 people in it, uh, spread out over, out over 110 communities. Could people like ambassadors of a community say, how do I do on this uh, behavior design stuff? And then they start to apply this Octalysis to their own situation and they say, huh? Huh, we're scoring X, Y, Z. Does that make sense or is that not a way to apply it? Yeah, as long as you can define a desired behavior, we can improve it through good game creation design, the, the Octalysis framework, because like I said, everything we do is because of the eight core drives. If there's none of these eight, the behavior doesn't happen. Sometimes it's just loss and avoidance core drive. Like, oh, I've been filling this form for 40 minutes now. I don't want to lose my work. That still makes you want to continue, even though it's not, You'll, we might talk about it. it's on the bottom of the framework. It's more, uh, it creates a, a feeling that's out of control. Um, but generally speaking, it's all there. And so our projects really range across the board from uh, one of our clients, the largest steel manufacturing in the world, a manufacturer in the world, their factory uh, based in Brazil. And the goal is to reduce injuries. So have people enjoy reporting and removing hazards. And then we have projects that's motivating kindergartners in Shanghai to eat healthily and understand the environmental impact of their food. And there's another project that's about uh, a crowdfunding network for hundred millionaires and billionaires to work together and create, you know, to fund important projects. And then there's even religious organizations to get people in the organization to be, to be close to their God. So again, as long as you define desired behavior, we can improve it through these eight core drives. And, uh, and, you know, a lot of times it depends on the trigger, like, what kind of levers you have? What can you influence the policy? Or are you the are you the group leader or the the minister of labor in the country? But uh, you know, the the scope isn't a problem if you have the right. Uh, for instance, one of our big case studies is we helped a uh, a bank in Brazil, the second largest one, called Caixa Econômica Federal. And they had 83,000 employees with, within 4,500 locations. And the goal is to motivate all of them through gamification to be more supercharged on their work. And the end result was that there was actually a 46% lift in recurring profits, uh, which actually became uh, around a billion US dollars a year, extra, extra profits. And because of that, Kaisa, they rose from the number two public bank in Brazil to the number one public bank uh, due to this. So you could see mm -hmm. that if it's done well, it obviously, uh, and this is a unique case study because most projects is like, it starts with a smaller group, like a pilot, and then it gets really successful, maybe like 80%, 140% return, like uh, increase in KPIs. And then it tries to scale to another department. Then it steps on other people's toes and it gets like cut halfway. Uh, this one was the CEO immediately wanted all the employees to use it. And that's why, um, you know, the, the, the dollar amount of impact became so huge. Mm -hmm. So it's really leveraging uh, human motivation, uh, engagement, and, and, and the people you work with uh, to reach goals, whatever that is, as, as long as it's defined as a behavior. Yep. Ah, very cool. Yeah. Sasa and Julian, do you have any questions or deepen uh, deeper understanding that you need to know about octalysis or or something like uh, uh, in, in gamification in general? Mm. I was actually sorry, Julian. Go ahead, please. I'm sorry, I'm fine. You can go ahead and. Okay. I, I actually had a question about the octalysis. You, when you talk about it and say um, there needs to be at least. Um, are we saying some elements of the octalysis or all elements in the octalysis need to be present in order for us to actually try and gamify? You um, need at least one of those eight core drives okay. to do a behavior. Okay. And are there 
maybe some that would weigh more in the balance or is it more contextual depending on what needs to be done and so we're going to be looking yes. at some elements and not others yeah so each of these core drives have pros and cons so they have their effective things and but nothing's a silver bullet so there's always trade-offs and so and this is part of the reasons why it's graphed on the octagon uh the top ones uh, i call them white hat motivation core drives so it makes people feel powerful in control they feel good but there's no sense of urgency so you're doing things because you feel like you're saving the world you're making a difference connecting to your faith you're you're growing and achieving more and you're using your creativity feeling empowered so it feels great but there's no sense of urgency. So people tend to procrastinate because you're in full control. You can do it anytime you want. So you procrastinate. Fair. The bottom ones, I call it black hat motivation core drives. And it's basically uh, lets people feel a bit more urgent, obsessed, sometimes addicted. Uh, but in the long run, if that's the only motivator, it could feel a you could feel a, a, a leave a bad taste in your mouth because it feels like you're not in control of your own behavior. So things where you're doing something just to avoid a loss just because it's very scarce, you can't have it easily, or just because you don't know what's going to happen next. Um, and that's, again, that's what we call black hat motivation core drives. And then we have the left versus right. The left side, 246, we call this left brain core drives. And it doesn't necessarily mean it's geographically on the left side versus right, but it symbolically means, you know, left brain, logical brain, and the right brain core drive symbolically represents their emotional brain. What's interesting is the left brain core drives deal with extrinsic motivation things you do for a reward, a purpose, or a goal, but you don't necessarily enjoy the activity itself. So once you obtain the reward, you hit your goals, or you get used to the reward, you feel stale, you stop doing the behavior. Whereas the right side are the right brain core drives that deal with intrinsic motivation, things you just enjoy doing to the point that you're even willing to spend money just to experience it. And even if you lost all your progress the next day, you would lose your, your status, your achievement, your badges, your salary, your money, the NFTs, you would still want to do the activity today because that's how we measure our quality of lives. You know, how much time we just uh, spend on things we enjoy doing, like hanging out with our friends, whatnot. So as, as an example, on the right bottom, you see core drive seven, unpredictability and curiosity. So that's uh, like the gambling core drive or watching soap opera. You're just very curious. It's on the right bottom, which means it's right brain. Our brain enjoys it, but it's on the bottom black hat. We feel out of control. So this is like, you want to go to bed at 10 p.m., but then you'd binge watch Netflix till three in the morning. Okay. <laughs> so your brain about, enjoyed yeah. it. Yeah. So your brain enjoyed <laughs> it, but you felt out of control. And yes. so when we look at which corner it's at, which positions at, you know, the, the trade off, the pros and cons, and then a good game cage designer would know at what phase to use what core drive on what player type to create the best type of result. Uh Normally, we are used to, in our world, to pay for trainings like project management, and you pay. And then a scaled at your framework, and you pay a lot. And you have all kinds of roles in it, and you pay more. And now you, you do something weird here, Yuka. You basically open up your website, and, and I put the, the website here underneath. And you say, you, you know, you can just enjoy it for free. You can learn about it and apply it and see what it means. Like, what's your, what's your thought there? Like, why don't you sell this? <laughs> no, I do also do sell services. I do workshops. I do consulting and all that stuff. But I think the not one, the knowledge is robust enough where uh, I think it takes a long time to master it. And so I want a lot of people to learn it because I think it's very powerful. But um, it actually ends up, I didn't want it this way, but it ends up being very difficult to get really good at it. So for instance, the way we hire people, right? we would do design competitions and we would just say, hey, how would you redesign eBay or design this? And you have two months to figure this out. And then there are people who read my book maybe two, three times and they've studied, they went on my website, like you said, they study all the time and they would you know, deliver 20 to 40 pages of design analysis uh, documents and all that stuff. And then we would choose the finalists and we would inter interview them and we'd hire the best person. Now that, so this person is highly qualified, right? A lot of pre-training, but most of the time we still, this person still needs to be in the company for three to six months as full-time or to even make us comfortable to put them in front of a client and start doing work that represents our reputation. So um, so there, I, there are some pieces of work out there that if people spend 20, 10, 20 hours learning and they become experts. And so if they're like guarding those 20 hours into like a course, 
Uh, we, we, we don't, we're not worried about that. In fact, it's like, Hey, the more people get very good, the more people can hire very quickly and, uh, and become our designers and consultants. So, so yeah, one, I do love sharing the knowledge. I think it's, it, it can change lives and it has changed many lives. And two, I think the, the knowledge is deep enough that, uh, you know, we're, we're actually not worried that people just learn it and get too good at it. And, you know, if they want to get really good, then they do the, the workshops or they sign up for Octalysis Prime, which is why, where I threw like 1200 videos on it uh, yeah. for a monthly subscription. Yeah, which is basically learning in a game and uh, in, in a world uh, where you can go to different places and, and, and meet characters and so on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's often, yeah. it's often the, well, the learning is often anchored more when you get hands on. You could read as much as you want, but if you don't get hands on the thing, it's hard to actually make sense of it and use it later. That's my take on yeah. it. Yeah, and, and this is why um, in Octalysis Prime, we let people experience all these core drives and game design techniques. For instance, someone would be reading the book and they said, oh, the scarcity core drive, right? I see why some gamers would be attracted, but I'm a busy executive. I would never fall for this. And they go to Octalysis Prime and they, for some reason, realize they come back and open the treasure chest every single day. <laughs> and it's like, why? It's because you're only allowed to open it once a day. And if you don't, you feel like you lost something. And it's yeah. also unpredictable. So it allows people to, oh, experience it themselves. And we have a, a what they call a DAU over MAU, daily active user over monthly active user rate of 38%, uh, which roughly translates to if you come on to this platform at least once a month, we care, somewhat care, uh, 38% chance uh, you come every single day. And, uh, and Netflix is the, I don't know the new stats, but back in the day, it was the golden like example of 42%. But, you know, Netflix is all about, we talk about addictive cliffhangers and drama where <laughs> Octalysis Prime is really watching my face talk about gamification all day long. So I'm okay to be a little lower than that. And it led to a really funny story. I remember there was one time a, a member telling me, hey, you caught, I think the leveling system is broken. I'm like, oh, what do you mean it's broken? It's like, I feel like I'm leveling up too quickly. I'm already at silver status. I'm not even one of the hardcore players like, like the others. And I'm like, okay, I'm interested. Let's let's explore. What did you sign up to Octalysis Prime? And she said, uh, about 15, 16 months ago. I said, okay, and how, how often do you come on? She's like, well, at least I'll make sure I come on twice a day for the chess and answering the quiz question of the Geomon. On top of that, sometimes I've said, like, whoa, 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 wait. So you're telling me that you've been on this platform, octalysisprime.com, every single day without fail for 16 months. And she's like, yeah, that's that's it. And I said, and you still and you still think you're leveling too fast. And she's like, yeah, well, maybe. Uh, so if you don't know, it's like there's a few stats. There's blue status, orange, purple, silver, and then there's uh, gold and there's black. So she's like four out of six. I'm like, okay, I'm, pr I'm still pretty happy with where you It's not broken. So, you know, so people are just, really engage with the platform and learning. And again, many of them consume all 1200 videos. Uh, they're 10 minutes each. So you can, you can imagine how long, how long that is. And they become really good at Octalysis. Yeah. So I have one question, you guys, uh, like the framework is framework, but uh, how, to, how do you embed this in the organization? I mean, the there must be a, a change management and as well as like stakeholder engagement activities going on, right? Because uh, do you do feasibility assessments uh, before kind of uh, going to apply uh, the framework? Yeah, so we have a five-step design process that uses the framework lock, but not every step. Every, step one is what we call the strategy dashboard and defines a lot of components, like what, what are the business metrics, who are the player types we're engaging, the desired action, FIBA mechanics, reward incentives, things like that. Uh, step two is the brainstorming, which we usually come up with about you know, 100, 200 ideas based on those eight core drives. Um, and then step three is something called the PE feature list, so power and ease. Uh, so for all these 100 ideas, we, we, we put on a spreadsheet and we label you know, um, how, how powerful it is to drive behavior and how easy it is to implement it. And then we circulate with a lot of team members on the client side to understand what resources it costs. And so we'll end up saying, okay, from this, uh, these features, these seven are V1 features and these others are V2. 
and we got the teams that need to implement aligned. And then step four is what we call a battle plan spreadsheet. So it's a lot of the mathematical details, reward schedules, probability charts, uh, the, the, the economy and game loop that's all defined. And then step five is more uh, prototyping it and, and, you know, creating the interactive prototype on Figma. So that's, that's all just creating the design. And then after five steps, then it's about the implementation, which is like, kind of like you said, about building and, and pushing it through. And every, every organization is very different as, as you know, and some, uh, like the one I just talked about Kaija that the CEO just pushes through in every department and some, you really have to tiptoe around and kind of say, oh, can we use this place on your website, this button on this page, not the website, on this page on our website. Uh, so every project's different. So it's, it's just, um, mm -hmm. uh, and, and but, but of course, every step also involves the Alcalis framework because, uh, you know, everyone working on the project, they're mo working on it and motivated by those same core drives. Some are motivated by loss and avoidance, like I might lose my job, this might replace me. Some are motivated by, uh, social influence, like I would only do it if this other group do it. Some people are motivated by development accomplishment. Like I, after this, I probably get a promotion. And I've seen probably in projects where when it's a big campaign, there's like 70, 80% of the employees thinking that once they finish implementing, they might get laid off. And so they try to make it slow and slower and slower. And then 20, 30% think that after they finish it, they're like, strong key, key key people who made it happen so they'll get promoted and they're trying to they're trying to push the the first group to work faster so uh, everything we do is based on these dynamics so some projects are about literally just pushing through bureaucracy so what's mm -hmm. about the pitfalls and challenges that you you face in uh, implementing gamification in large organizations mostly I think the the biggest issue that we face, and to be honest, we haven't figured out a good way to to even mitigate that, is everything's done, everything's happy, everything's about implement or, or in the middle of implementation, and then uh, and then the uh, the leader of the group or whoever's the sponsor in charge switches person, and this new person comes in and it's like I have new plans, I wanted new things, and throw everything away and just do something else. So, uh, and we a lot of them don't even get to interact with that person we just get a notice to say you know this whole thing is scratched and because of a new direction so i think that that is that is very difficult um and so far when we're able to to um mitigate even a little bit of it is just have a lot have a really clear concise document about how everything came to be which is hard to be concise in a sense but if they if they ask this question, like, why is this here? And they quickly glance through, it's like, oh, this actually looks really cool. Like this actually could be something I want to do. Uh, that's when we, we we mitigate that, yeah. And if that's a big, uh, big challenge, then the question is, uh, how long does it take to get something going? And uh, that's the pre-work and when it's going, when do you see benefits pay, paying off? Like, is there is is there some kind of a, a a timeline that you can mention? Are we talking about a few few weeks to prepare and a few months to see payoffs, or how would you say that? It depends on the project and like you talked about the cost, right? So, like, if we design the same solution uh, to a Fortune five hundred and to a startup, then we would be very bad designers, right? And in fact, some of the uh, the best use cases are just done for a classroom for like middle schools and they obviously don't have a huge budget. So in that case, they would actually use analog, like a poster with, with cutouts and dice rolls. And sometimes they could put onto TV like a 10 second encouragement video. Um, so so those are obviously low budget. Very fast. Just even like think about kindergartner stickers, right? That's mot That's motivating a lot of kindergartners in many countries. So for the kindergartner that pulled sticker, is core drive to development accomplishment, right? For adults, if you give them a little sticker for like answering a question, then they might not be as entertained or feeling proud of it. Um, so it always depends on uh, how you solve it. Could be like it could just be writing an email with these eight core drives to engage people, uh, or doing but, but a Kickstarter more, video. More specifically, because this is a generic answer that you you would give, uh, it gives insights in uh, varying lengths and so on. But uh, you say one of the biggest challenges is that there might be a different sponsor coming in and then uh, your progress is washed or swiped away. 
in, in those instances, are we talking about la large uh, uh, investments for a long time or or what kind yeah. of uh, setting? I, has I that? guess it, it still depends on the goal and the design. So there are projects that come to us and said, we want to do like a month, uh, like a, a marketing push to drive users into our loyalty program. We did that with Latin Airlines, actually. And uh, we actually have a case study for that, not for the numbers. And uh, so basically everything was for something to launch in two months. And and so we launched something that could be done in two months and it drove a lot of results. A lot of other projects, uh, you know, if you want to create something that engages, oh, the, the Funny Fire one with the Kaija Economic Federal, sorry, Funny Fire is a new word, but that's the technology uh, providers. Uh, that one was actually launched in three months um, and then, they kept improving and scaling it, uh, and at nine month point, they they say they got to that billion dollar extra profit uh, mark. Uh, but a lot of projects, especially with the slower, uh, like getting the IT people to open their databases, connect the API. There's a lot of projects that take over like close to a year or even a little over to be fully implemented, um, and those are are a bit more at risk. Generally speaking, if you bring our company into doing something. Uh, it also is a bit more high high scope, and uh, because obviously we 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 uh, are a bit more expensive in the market, so you wouldn't uh, hire us just to create some cutouts in, in in one classroom at least, maybe for a whole school system or country's curriculum, um, and also you wouldn't uh, bring us in for a small. Sometimes we do like uh, if if they have like a one conference, like one event where they bring all the executives together and they have to come up with a new idea where the company's going and strategize and, and innovate. Uh, yeah, we can gamify that one event. So in that case, like one or two days, then you already see the results from it. So it, I, I know it's generic, but every project is so different. But part of it is setting the right parameters. If you tell us we only have this time, we only have this budget, um, and we have we, we want to try to do this, then Again, we we don't do magic work, but we would um, make it as successful as possible within those parameters. I think it's going to be essential in, I'd say, five years. So if you think about this, right, this is about creating engagement to your customers and to your employees. So I think now if you apply gamification, it's a competitive advantage. And then three, three, three years later, it will no longer be a competitive advantage. It will be a kind of like a normal thing. And five years later, I think companies will do it just for survival. Because imagine if uh, all, all your competitors, right, their workplace is very engaging. There's a strong sense of we'll epic meaning and calling. People feel a sense of uh, purpose in the work they do. There's They feel like there's a, 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 a good path to improve and achieve mastery. There's autonomy, they can use a creativity, self-expression, they feel socially appreciated at work, right? And your company doesn't, your company, we just we just pay them and we yell at them, we tell them to do good work, to work harder, right? Obviously, everything else being equal, these employees will go to the other companies. Your customers, right? If every company out there is creating engaging campaigns, interacting with their customers, then customers are like, wow, when I interact with this brand, I feel engaged, I know I'm part of this journey, I'm not just being blasted with one-off marketing messages, but I'm actually in their engaging loyalty program. I'm having fun, enjoying, I'm telling my friends about it. my friends have joined because of me then, and you don't do that. You're just like, Hey, buy this thing, you know, then you can, you're not going to survive. So obviously it's much better to do something when it gives you a competitive advantage, as opposed to when you do it for survival. just like websites, right? Back in the day, websites, like who cares about website? It's a gimmick, only nerds like websites. And then, but if you have a website, it's a, at one point it's a competitive advantage. Nowadays, if you don't have a website, you're not even considered a real business, right? So, um, so I think and that's going to happen in a few years. I, I would agree that behavioral design or being uh, uh, um, mindful of how you design an experience in the workplace is definitely gaining in, in, in importance. On the other hand, I wonder, uh, did you 10 years ago say that 15 years later, it will be uh, uh, mandatory or did you 10 years ago also say five years later it will be mandatory so i mean maybe it's a moving target isn't it 
I've never said five years later, 10 years ago. I didn't oh, okay. say that at all because, <laughs> because 10 years ago, I was a crazy person and trying to <laughs> share something that the world didn't believe in. But I see it now, I, you know, based on the clients that reach out to me, you know, Tesla, Google, mm. IDEO, mm. Lego, uh, yeah. airlines, I see it happening. So I, I do believe that uh, there's a big trend coming. A lot mm. of banks. Well, crazy is not a bad thing, actually, when you come to work <laughs> with people that have been always used to a certain way of doing things and always the same patterns and always the same things that repeat. I'm curious to know. So you have probably, you've been doing this for a while. You have probably come across examples where gamification has been applied in unexpected or unconventional fields outside of the typical context like marketing or educations. Could you share maybe a surprising application of gamification that stood out for you? Yeah, most of them fall into four fields. Either it's marketing or product design or employee motivation or sell, lifestyle gamification, yeah. sometimes that relates to like medicine compliance or working out or whatnot. But uh, I guess over the years, I've seen some like a bit more interesting. And again, when I when I talk about gamification design, I have that broad definition, right? And and even in that broad definition, there's, there's what's called explicit gamification design, which is that it looks like game feels like a game. People can opt in or opt out of it and um and they can play and then there's implicit gamification which is it's, it's like um a doorknob the best designs are invisible that you just use it to open the door but you don't pay attention so it has a lot of emotional triggers to make people feel accomplished appreciated like if you go on linkedin.com mm -hmm. most people don't feel like hey they're trying to make me play a game when you see this progress bar or whatnot right um so so there's that and in that definition of engagement design uh, things that use the eight-core drive to make us engage and have enjoy something. Uh, I think one one application that I thought was really intriguing was there was an airline that approached me and they said they want to motivate the airline pilots to become more humorous um, <laughs> because they said you know especially when there's a like a delay of the flights and everyone's on the sitting on their plane and it's not taking off, uh, people get a little bit upset and so if the if the pilot was a little more humorous, it spoke in a fun way, then people could be have longer tolerance of the long flight. And it, you can, this is like maybe seven, six, seven years ago, but you, you have seen some airlines when they, you watch their, um, you watch their videos, their safety videos, they started yeah. doing rap songs and yes. started bouncing all around. <laughs> yeah. So they, they are working hard on trying to make this, this, this again, process focus experience more human focused. How about community practice? And there are some challenges. One, can we apply gamification in the way you, you subscribe to it? No, I think we learned, yes, the Octalysis uh, framework, we can uh, apply to, to any environment. Uh, but what would be some kind of ideas that you would get in, in, in your second phase, brainstorm a hundred ideas? Like what, what ideas would you potentially give in such a situation? If that makes sense as a question to you. Okay, first I'm just understanding 8,000 people connected throughout a, what's a 17,000 company? Yeah, uh, 70,000 people and out of the 17,000 people, about 8,000 people are connected via uh, voluntary communities of practice. Okay, so, okay, I understand. Yeah. So, what, is, what, is the des what is the desired actions you want them to take? Um, uh, I, I think that uh, uh, having a specific uh, behavior for that already may help, but what we currently define is when you're new in a role or a job, maybe a community of practice is a, is a key way to learn and to grow and to grow a network. So uh, learning, growing a network might be behaviors we want to see, uh, but then in reality, people don't get time for that from their manager or it's not known what exactly the, is expected from them. So uh, it, it's not really happening in many times. So when people okay, so, click on the button and then they're supposed to be there sometimes in a meeting, but yeah, they don't know. Okay. So the desired action is for them to click a button, join the meeting and actually pay attention and learn from the meeting. Uh, and contribute and maybe uh, network together, maybe open okay. it or be okay. imaginative, maybe more than what is happening currently. Okay. Okay. Yes. And I need to break it down into desired action, like 
what the person actually did. So people don't say, uh, I'm doing networking right now. They'll say, I'll go to visit this thing. I'll open this book. I'll take this class. I'll meet more people. Um, and so networking is something. So for instance, Amazon, right? Amazon uh, could have two big desired actions, you know, go to Amazon and then buy something. But every between these two major steps, there's all these little, little desired actions like finding your product, looking at the reviews, putting your credit card and every step of the way uh, people could be dropping out. And so that's why we we try to break it into very specific, like the person can immediately say, I'm doing this action and what's motivating to do this action. So, but I'm just getting a, a feel, obviously this is the, the, the big exercise, but I'm um, just getting a feel of, of this. Um, and actually there's an interesting analogy I'll, I'll bring up if we have time after this little exercise about the difference between uh, booking.com, which is a client of ours and Amazon and how their strategy would be different based on some variables. Um, but okay, so, I'd say, generally speaking, with a project like this, again, without knowing more specifics, number first thing I think it's useful to have a a core a core epic meaning and calling, a core theme about why people are there in the first place. Especially for voluntary position, people are not there for money or left uh, less of those extrinsic left brain core drives. They're there because they feel like you know there's a there's a meaning and purpose, right? And you have to define it very very clear. Now, most companies make a mistake in that. Maybe an onboarding when people sign up, there's the like, here's the mission statement and it's like epic and it came from like a two week retreat by the executives. And he's like, wow. And if you're just out of college, like, oh, wow, this company's all about changing the world. And on day two, you realize, hey, no one cares about it, right? The executives don't remember it and no one talks about it. And so when you join your second job, you become smarter on day one. You don't even believe it, care on day one, right? Uh, but when I work with Lego, I noticed that everyone in the company, at least the majority of them I talked to, they, they care about their mission statement because they repeat it all the time, like to the point where outsiders said they're really annoying. They keep telling us their their six principles in the beginning of every single meeting, but they take sacrificial actions. Like one guy at Lego, he said he had an opportunity to get a promotion and get a high higher salary, but he turned it down because he feels the current position uh, fulfills Lego's mission statement better because it's close to the customers. Mm -hmm. Um, and so he's, so you want to really understand what that theme is not for the company itself, cause that's not desired action, but for these, uh, voluntary communities. So why come together and you want to tie it to a big, a big theme, um, that is about like their project that are about just making money and money, making money sounds sleazy. So it's about obtaining freedom, right? Financial freedom, or it's about, uh, connecting, getting respect in the workplace, whatever it, it just find something that people can resonate with just like open source projects because this is an open source project basically this right volunteer volunteers coming together and then you want to reinforce that concept you want to show that people are taking uh the company actually takes sacrificial actions to fulfill this this purpose and so people then it has believability so that's number one okay just number one uh number two is there should be a sense of development accomplishment so people who go there should actually feel like they grow in the way to see that they have grown a bit. Uh, sometimes it's, it's actual skill growth, but it's hard to measure. Sometimes it's just like saying that, hey, if you come here, we show that you've come here, you participated, and there's something that uh, their their managers could see. So so getting credit, if they're not getting money, at least they feel like they should get, a, get credit. So somehow if there's a recording of how they participate, how they perform, whatnot, uh, and they know that their manager or their boss's boss would would see this, uh, then obviously they feel like, okay, I got to participate more because I want to stand out. And this is one way, because a lot of employees, I know they're very frustrated about, they feel like they work hard, but they never get, you know, exposure, uh, to the management team or get credit for that. So if this is, if they feel like this is the way to get more exposure, uh, sometimes the reward, if you design rewards is like, Hey, the VP will have lunch with you or the, the, the top five people for this month or whatnot. Um, you know, that's something that, can get them to be interested. Uh, you really want to reinforce core drive five social influence and relatedness. And so that's on the middle, right? So, which means in the middle, it means could be white hat or black hat, depending on how to design for it. White hat is collaboration. So it feels good, but there's no urgency. Black hat is competition. And so, um, so it feels more urgent, but some people don't want to feel like this cutthroat type of mentality. So the best of both worlds is sometimes team competition. So if you have, so not everyone wants to be competitive, but people don't want to drag down their team. 
So you have all these different communities or different groupings and potentially you can create some kind of ranking about, okay, see who uh, has participated most or hit the desired actions or whatnot. Um, and those people get the honor and the status or whatnot. And so if they're a serious group, they'll try to rally each other to do a bit more. Yeah, these are all small components. Depending on how well you do it, it will have varying effects. And also they're all just pieces of the puzzles. And you wanted to say something? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, just the way you address this is to me very valuable because you show how you uh, identify those small steps that people take. And, and I think that that is the way to, to go about it. And then you just share, hey, you can think alongside the axis of the octalysis and you can start to think towards these actions. So uh, that's the value of what you show here. And thanks for that. Uh, I don't want to wrestle more value uh, for free out of you. That, that's why I was <laughs> like, okay, let me let me thank you in this. Oh. It's very clear. Okay. So yeah. 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 But basically just did what I did, but 20 times more. And then you'll have <laughs> yeah. a selection of things to improve and just make sure they all connect together in a nice game loop way. Like it all it all fits well together because if you have implement 50 amazing ideas, it doesn't mean it's great. I could just be crowded and confusing. Just like even if you have all the right ideas, if you have all the uh, body parts of an animal doesn't mean you have a living, breathing animal, right? It could just be like the flesh here, like <laughs> eyes here, lungs here. It should come together in a cohesive way that feels like that to become a living, flying animal, right? So you got to make sure it's the, the details are, are covered and it, it's cohesive. Uh, yeah. And so anyway, so just that's how you would tackle the problem. I don't know if you have other questions, but I suddenly thought about the 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 booking.com versus Amazon example. And I, you know, if you want me to share, I can share that too. Yeah, please. Oh, that would be good. Yeah. All right. So this is a good example of difference between uh, short-term black hat motivation design versus long-term white hat motivation design. So booking.com, they're mostly looking for the one-time transaction, right? And so they focus a lot more on the black hat core drive. So it's all about loss and avoidance and scarcity. It's like, oh, there's only two tickets left and there's 20 people looking at it and you'll have 10 seconds, nine seconds, eight, and you're like, oh, gotta buy, gotta buy. So you buy the ticket, right? So you did the desired action, booking.com make money, uh, but you don't. You might not feel the most uh, comfortable. You might feel, oh, I was kind of rushed into it. Maybe there's a little buyer's remorse. Uh, but the, way, the reason why booking.com can kind of get away with it is because it's a low frequency transaction. Most people don't buy tickets every week. So after six months, most people forget about that negative feeling and they think, oh, I think last time I used booking.com, I have some loyalty points, so let me do it again. But if for amazon.com, it's totally different because Amazon wants people to buy 10 times a day. And I firmly believe that if every time people buy on Amazon, they have this negative, like out of control, black hat motivation feeling, people will want to go onto Amazon less. And as a result, uh, their business metrics will suffer. So what Amazon does is you focus on other core drives, two and five. Development accomplishment, which is about feeling smart and accomplished, and core drive five, social influence relatedness. So about feeling smart, people go on and they feel like, okay, I have all the information I need. Uh, it's very clean. I can, if I order something, I know I'll get it in one or two days. I can return it very easily. In fact, my wife, when she's choosing between blenders, she will buy three different blenders on Amazon, use it for a couple of days and return two because the process apparently is so easy. I still find a lot of work, but she likes to do that. Um, and then core drive five, which is... Um, you know, safety in numbers, you you see, oh, I see the review. I see what other people like, you know, people like you are buying this, right? People similar to you are looking at this and buying this. And so people feel safe. So Amazon strategies make you feel smart, make you feel safe. And they will still use Black Hat, but in short bursts of activities like, you know, Black Friday, right? Lightning deals. So, and that's usually the way most companies should do it, which is Generally, marketing is, is white hat and people want to work with the organization, but they kind of procrastinate. And then you have short bursts of black hat motivation to say, hey, limited time offer. You got, you know, one day to do this or whatever. Um, so, so you can see here that some people will look at us like booking.com and they're like, hey, we're doing e-commerce too. Let's just copy all their strategies. Uh, but you, if they don't realize in this particular example, the key variable is frequency of purchase. Right. If you so if it's low frequency, black hat works very well. If it's high frequency, you want to have more white hat and they just copy random things, then they could lead to failure or uh, or undesirable results, which is why a lot of times you'll see like T-Mobile copy what at and is doing and they still don't do so well. So uh, but yeah, those are those are things we want to see when we understand the core drives and understand how to do 
design and noticing all the subtle uh, differences. I I had one 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 question. I mean, um, I I want to know what was the trigger for you, Yukai, to start this uh, gamification journey. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's... so in in two thousand and three. Yeah. I played a lot of games and spent thousands of hours playing games. But what I didn't like was I didn't like all my time being wasted on nothing. So I figured out a way to make playing games <laughs> useful and productive. Yeah, literally, I, I quit playing this game called Diablo 2. And I realized that I spent thousands of hours making my in-game characters amazing, a lot of gold, a lot of gear, high level. And the real life, I was the same loser. So then I became obsessed with how do you create games where the more hours you spend on it, the better your real life is? And how do you make real life import activities more enjoyable like a game? And that's how I started my journey. And do you still play video games, right? I mean, I know that. What's your favorite video game right now? Uh, it rotates, but I think recently I've been playing a lot of this the, a mobile game called One Punch Man. Mm -hmm. And I end up spending a, a lot of money on it. I think I spent $4,000 on this one mobile oh, game. Oh, wow. <laughs> Yeah, but it's it's always a good, interesting learning experience. Uh, at one point, I started noticing clients are at the age, I guess, to to like talk a lot about World of Warcraft, like they played when they were in college, and now they're executives, so they'll use terms of World of Warcraft. Uh, in fact, the Starbucks, uh, I think, chief loyalty officer who who introduced their loyalty program, uh, put in his resume he was like a level 60 paladin in World of Warcraft back in the day. Now, so I'm like, okay, I didn't play this game, but I probably should. And then uh, literally like a thousand hours went by for me to play the game. But then immediately I used things I learned in uh, some of my client projects in my design. So uh, like I, like my goal uh, was intended to, it's like, it's not a waste of time when you uh, when you get better in real life as you play games. Is there a, maybe a competing source of behavioral design that you say, well, that's not gamification, but it does the same same stuff uh, just to start to close for today? Mm, I don't know if I, like, I think, again, if it drives behavior through engagement motivation, then then I think it is. Oh, well, there is a there is this thing that some people say it's gamification, but and then sometimes no, it's incentivization. So basically, just paying people for boring things, uh, <laughs> and and so it's like you create a game and you say you play this game boring game for a thousand times, you'll get a badge or get a reward. Literally, someone uh, I know, not me, someone talked to the the founder, one of the co founders of like Udemy. And they say, hey, you really need to gamify your platform. And they say, oh, we're already gamified. So really, I haven't seen it. Where is it on your platform? It's like, well, we pay our instructors uh, for doing courses. And so again, if that was the if that was gamification, then by definition, every job in the world is gamification. So uh, but I, I, you know, we 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 probably assume that most people don't feel excitement and fun doing the majority of their jobs. So could 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 the design could use some work. Last question. You were talking about your work uh, with Lego, and uh, during my time as a Scrum Master, I learned about uh, Lego Serious Play. I don't know if you've heard about it. You probably have. Um, and was wondering what you thought about it and how it related to um, the gamification. Yeah, I have heard about it. Uh, when I was there, I was helping with them uh, do something related to more with... Um, like having kids build something and turn it into a digital form. So it's like, again, also like a, almost like a uh, on, offline to online experience where the things they create can last and be social about it. Um, for I didn't work directly with Lego series, but I have heard it ar around, but I don't have a lot of insights about it. But I think a lot of it is, uh, again, using these tools to uh, help with creativity and, uh, you know, solve solve problems improve yes yeah. no, it was most, yeah. mostly about problem solving well at least for the few times i've used it before but it was really interesting you get people to to talk about things that they would know how to articulate if you asked them to use words so they use bricks instead which was interesting yeah there's a whole lot of studies that show 
if you just told people to solve a problem uh, and you say, we'll pay you, like even saying, well, if you can solve this problem, we'll pay you six months worth of salary and it, can, and it would take 20 <laughs> minutes to solve. People couldn't solve it very fast. But if you say, hey, just just play with it, see how long it takes to solve it. People solve yeah. it much faster. And uh, and so play is play really helps us think better, be more creative and solve problems faster. And there's all this mm-hmm. this behavioral science about intrinsic, extrinsic, about focus versus expansive thinking uh, mm-hmm. that we can get into. But generally speaking, when you can make when you can make problem solving more fun, you usually get much better results. Very much indeed. We yeah, agree with that. Thank you. Okay, so I think that's we can conclude, uh, Abram, right? And yeah. some... Thanks a lot for your time. Um, is there anything uh, that we can uh, do for you to uh, make this also a good worthy hour? Should we, should we do something uh, in uh, how many people watched it, or uh, I don't know? Should we get some 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 information back to you? Uh, I think the most important thing is if people don't just listen to it, it's like, hey, that's so interesting, and they leave. If you mm-hmm. actually try to learn and apply it and improve your project, I would really love to hear if anyone said, hey, because they listened to us talk for an hour, something <laughs> in lives got better. You know, that's the kind of feedback that's more meaningful than, oh, a lot of people watched yeah. the video, right? So yeah. I like sure. it. Thank yeah. you. Welcome. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Have a, have a great day. Thank you. And so have a good day. Thank you. We'll get in touch. Thank you. Take care. Thank Take you. Care. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye.